Uh, good morning. Uh, today, Pastor Peter Chin will share the message from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Uh, you can follow along on page 800 in the Pew Bibles in front of you or on the screen above. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, remember that formerly, you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves a circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the, the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord and in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Philip. Um, today, um, what I wanted to do is we are going to celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, at the end of today's service, but before that, I wanted to give a continuation of what we talked about last week. Last week, we talked a little bit about various concepts. One of the things that we discussed was the idea of shalom, right? The Hebrew word for peace. And what we said was that we often think of peace when we hear that word. We think about it as a feeling, that feeling of tranquility, that everything is okay, that God is in control. And that often becomes kind of our, the major way in which we understand that word peace. And so we assume shalom means that that the Old Testament word shalom means that feeling of, of contentment and tranquility we have when we know God is in control of all things. What we learned last week was although shalom does mean peace between uh, God and between people, it actually is much deeper than that. That it's not just a spiritual, emotional thing, but it has layers underneath it. Another definition or translation of shalom is the welfare or state of an individual or a group. And we talked about this in Genesis where um, uh, Joseph is asking about the welfare of his father because he hadn't seen his father for many, many years. And he asked about his shalom. He's not asking, does my father have peace and tranquility? He's asking about his literal, physical state, saying, is he well? Is he alive? Is he healthy? Shalom was not just an internal, emotional thing. It also described a person's well-being and whether they were whole and healthy. And so there's that deeper meaning there. But a third meaning for shalom is to pay someone back, or literally reparations. In Exodus chapter 20 and 21, we find that when people wrong one another, when they trespass, when they destroy each other's property, they have to make that relationship whole. They've got to restore it and, and pay that back. And that word, believe it or not, is a variation of the word shalom. Right? To make that relationship whole is, is, the, is the word shalom. And so that's so interesting that this concept, this word that we often narrowly define as something about our heart and about our relationship with God always was far deeper. It always had so many more levels of, of, um, of meaning that dealt with other people and their physical welfare, how they were really doing and whether your relationships were right and whether you were treating people appropriately and whether you had wronged them or not. That was always included in that word. And what we said was that like with fasting and the Sabbath, shalom is not just a spiritual concept. It is also a matter of justice that involves the welfare of those around us. That shalom is just like the Sabbath. Remember, the Sabbath was not just a time of rest for individuals, but it was supposed to be pushed out and extended to multiple people. The Sabbath from the very beginning was a command that, um, that people could rest, but also children could rest. And that servants could rest, slaves could rest, the land could rest, animals could rest. 
It was not just, oh, I'm going to rest in God. It was that everyone needs to rest in God. This is a matter of, of equity and justice, that even slaves need to rest during this time. Or you think about fasting, when we talked about from Isaiah chapter 58 last week, how God says in Isaiah 58 and Zechariah chapter 7, if you're going to fast without justice, without thinking about the people around you, you're not fasting. He essentially almost makes a quip, like a joke, saying, oh, you were fasting. I didn't know that because you were living unjustly. And so we see all of these very spiritual things that, again, we very narrowly define as spiritual between us and God from the very beginning involved other people. From the very beginning, their definition involved the welfare of other people. They were words of justice. We have narrowed it. We have pushed that aside and decided to choose what we define these words to be, including the word shalom, and how we have to stop doing that. We have to recognize that we as modern Christians have made this choice, but this was never how these words were intended. They always blended together our relationship with God and our relationship and the welfare of other people. So that's what we talked about last week, and I think it's, a really, it's very close to our heart as a church this understanding that justice and spirituality are not separate ideas at all. They're so intertwined. It's like a fabric. You can't really tell one thread apart from the other. And so that's what we talked about last week. And I want to continue that conversation today by saying this, that while the Israelites under, understood shalom much better than ourselves, the Old Testament is a story of how they fill, fail to fulfill the calling to shalom time and time again. So it's true that the people of Israel would have understood the depth of shalom much better than us, of course, because they, they spoke and wrote in Hebrew, right? They knew that shalom was not just a peaceful feeling or sentiment in your heart. They knew that it meant the welfare of people. And they knew it meant whether you were living in a right relationship or whether you had wronged someone. They knew all of these things. And so they were clearer on the understanding and the meaning of shalom but that does not mean they were any better at fulfilling it. Because in many ways, when you go through the Old Testament, what we are finding is the failure of the people of Israel in every single season, no matter what the context is, no matter what tools they have at their, at their disposal, the failure to fulfill this shalom that they understood, that they knew. And you think about it, there's so many different seasons of the people of Israel, and they're always searching and trying to establish shalom, and yet they fall short. When they come out of captivity, now they have their freedom and they have the literal words of, of God inscribed on a rock. They have these things to guide them into shalom, into a peaceful existence, a peaceful community between themselves and God. They've got rules to dictate how they treat one another. They've got rules to have a healthy relationship with God. But what do we find in the wilderness? Do we find shalom? Do we find that they fulfill this calling that they, they are equipped for, that they understand? No. They spend the entire time bickering in idolatry instead. So they're, they're longing instead for the promised land, that maybe the promised land will finally allow them to enter into this calling instead. And so they enter in and they have judges like Deborah leading them and guiding them uh, during that time. But by the end of the book of Judges, in Judges 19 through 21, we read that although they have the judges and although they have, they're in the promised land, the end of the book of Judges ends in civil war. And it's a civil war based off atrocity. Some of us don't realize this, but in, in, in Judges 19 through 21, what happens is that some men from the tribe of Benjamin um, actually rape and kill a concubine. That they, they uh, kidnap a woman and just rape her until she dies. And this is so atrocious that the rest of the tribes of Israel rise up in war. And they're not committing war against the Philistines or against the Midianites. They're committing war against the tribe of Benjamin. And they nearly wipe them out. They nearly destroy one of their own family members, one of their own tribes, one of those brothers. Right? They, they almost wipe them out in that moment. And that is where we end up after the promised land, after this, this, this big promise that now we have this land, we've got, we've got this peace, surely we can live in shalom, and this is where they end up. At the end of the book of Judges, the last line is, people did whatever they wanted, and they had no king. The understanding being, the implication, if they had a king, then they're going to live into shalom. That's what we need. We need to be like other nations. We need to have a king. And that's what they put their hope in, that they're finally going to have this, this deep peace if a king is in charge. But, of course, we know that's not going to happen either. 
The most famous king of Israel, King David, is a man who would sleep with his soldier's wife, with one of his, uh, his men's wife. That's not shalom. And when that wife becomes pregnant, in order to avoid the consequences of this action, what does he do? He arranges for that man to be killed and doesn't even think twice about it. That's not shalom. And then all of his sons, the sword never leaves that house to the very end of the time of kings. They don't live in shalom. And so what I'm trying to illustrate is that it's true that the Israelites understood shalom very well. They, they don't have the language cultural barrier that we do. But just because they understood it doesn't mean they actually did it. Just because they, they comprehended it didn't mean they fulfilled it. Because the entire story of the Old Testament is how in every season and context they fall short over and over again. But I don't bring this up to cast um, criticism on the people of Israel. I think this is an illustration of us. This is an illustration of our history. This is ultimately something that I think exemplifies us. It is a, a, a moment for us to recognize futility, our futility of pursuing shalom in our own strength. Right? That when we try to do the same thing, when we try to establish peace between ourselves and God in a lasting way, how over and over we try so hard with so many different tools and yet we end up in age after age in the same place we were before. Is that not where we are right now? You know, one thing I'm always struck by, you know, I've studied history for a long time, is that um, there was a time, actually a good amount of time, where there was hope for the end of war. You guys, you guys have heard that, right? At the end of World War I, there was this, actually World War I was justified as the war to end all wars. It was, let's just get it out of our system, right? Let's just, let's just be done with this. And let's establish the League of Nations and we'll finally be done with war. How long did that last? How long did that last before even a more catastrophic war would take its place? And then a series of wars. It would be global war after that point in time. Where war would never cease from that point in time. To the point where we are right now, no one even talks about world peace. Have you ever heard an expert or a historian or a politician even put out the idea that we could live in peace anymore? We don't even talk about it. This is this, this story of the people of Israel about how they long and they understand that they need this peace, but they fail at it, is our story as well. It's our history. It's the news. It is the reality which surrounds us. And I think this is a moment for us to recognize the futility of trying to establish this calling, trying to live into shalom on our own merits, on our own strength. But there will come a change in the story of the Bible, which is heralded in Isaiah chapter 9. In Isaiah chapter 9, I, the prophet Isaiah will give a prophecy, which is more often spoken about in, um, during Advent season. But it says this, For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. So right there, the prophet Isaiah is talking about shalom. He's talking about the end of war. He's talking about this deep peace. What's really interesting is where he says that comes from in the next verse. He says, for to us, or you could also translate as because, because to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that word is shalom. Prince of shalom. And he goes on to say, Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And so we see this big shift happening, right? That before, shalom was a calling. It was a command given to the people of Israel in the book of Exodus and Leviticus 25 and all throughout the Old Testament. And finally, here we see something different. Isaiah continues to talk about shalom, continues to talk about peace, but now it's not centered around a calling. It's centered around a person. It becomes around a prince of peace, around a child instead. And it, it, it decenters around this thing we have to do to a person that we wait for. And the person, of course, we know from Ephesians chapter 2 is Jesus. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, as it was read this morning, it says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. 
This shalom that we desire is Jesus. No longer there's something that we live up to. It is someone that we look up to, which is so different. And there are several ways in which Jesus becomes our peace, in which he becomes the shalom. First off, that he teaches and lives out peace. I think for many of us as, um, as evangelical Christians, we often overlook the incredible impact of Jesus' life as it was lived out and modeled. We, we know him as the one who died and rose again, and that is kind of the, the, the bulk of his ministry, and it, it, it certainly is, but we often overlook how transformative his life was. That even non-Christians who don't believe in his death and resurrection take him up as a model of how to live their life, of ethics. That's why he inspires people like Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr., because his life was so amazing. And that's part of how he becomes our peace. He lives out peace. He teaches it. In Matthew chapter 5, we read, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand it over, your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And so this is one of the ways in which Jesus becomes our peace, that he lives it out. He exemplifies it to us and teaches us how we should live. And this is one dimension of what it means that Jesus would become peace for us. Another aspect of Jesus becoming peace is that he establishes peace between ourselves and God. This is what we read in Colossians chapter 1. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So not only does Jesus exemplify peace and show us how to live peacefully, to live out shalom, he will make shalom between ourselves and God. That up to this point, we don't have peace between ourselves and God. We're enemies of God because of our behavior. But Jesus takes that upon himself. It's not that we got better. It's that Jesus took that, those sins, upon himself and crucified them for us. And so this is the second way in which we, he becomes peace for us, that he establishes peace between us and God. The third way in which Jesus um, becomes peace is that he makes peace possible between us, between one another. This is what we read this morning in Ephesians chapter 2, this peace that Jesus gives. He says, For he, he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. And so this is the third dimension of Jesus' peace. Not only does he live it out, not only does he allow us to have peace with God, but he makes peace between people possible. Here he talks about Jews and Gentiles, but it really relates to everyone. That now we don't have to be at odds with one another. Now, Now we're not really separate people, but instead we have the same father. We all have the same father, so we're the same family. And we have the same savior that we have access to that father. And so we, this peace that Jesus becomes is lived out among us. The fact that we have people here in our congregation from all, you know, cultures and nationalities and age groups, this is Jesus' peace at work. The reason we come here and we drink coffee and we sing songs and we listen to this is because we're one family in Christ. That's Jesus' peace here. Otherwise, we, we have no reason to be here. We'd be at Starbucks or probably sleeping. I know I'd be sleeping right now. That the only reason why we're here like this, in peace, together, considering each other brothers and sisters, is because of Christ. Because he has made this peace possible. So what we realize then is that it's the person of Jesus who fulfills the promise of shalom, this futile 
calling that the people of Israel could never really live into is fulfilled by Jesus. Jesus becomes our peace, and in that, he fulfills shalom. He, he lives it out. He exemplifies and teaches us how to live peacefully, and he allows us to have peace with God for all time, and he allows us to become one family. He becomes shalom. This shalom that we wanted but never were able to live up to, Jesus does that for us. And what's so powerful about that is that now we have hope. And we as Christians on this side of the cross, we have hope for shalom. We have hope to live in this deep understanding of peace, this calling of peace. Not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done. And we have to be that people of hope. Recognizing this is not just something that, that we do on our own strength. We do it because Jesus is strong. And that's where our hope for peace comes from. Two things that I think we can take away um, from this, this sense that Jesus himself is our peace. It's not just something that we do, but Jesus exemplifies peace. And the first thing that I take away is that if Jesus himself is our peace, that means all Christians are then called to peacemaking and shalom building. I think oftentimes when we hear the, the word peacemaker, peacemaking, we think of it as a very small or unique kind of person who would do that. We think about people who are very nice and like to help people get along. We think about, you know, maybe people who are in the Middle East trying to forge peace. And so we see it as a very narrow calling, right? It's, it's something that we think, yeah, I know some people who I would call peacemakers, but I don't really call myself that. I don't see myself in that way. But we have to realize if Jesus becomes peace, if he literally lives it out and establishes and creates it and makes it in so many different ways, then everyone who follows after Jesus is following after peace. Right? If he exemplifies it, if he is literally peace for us, then all of his followers automatically have a calling to peace as well. And that's implied in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes. Because in Matthew chapter 5, it says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. They will be called children of God. Two things that really stand out to me that, that press upon us, the universal calling to peacemaking. First is this, that it, it says the children of God are peacemakers. We often read the arrow of this, uh, the Beatitudes, really in one direction. That if you are a peacemaker, uh, you become a child of God. But I think it's equally appropriate to go the other way as well. If you consider yourself a child of God, you are a peacemaker. I think it's both of those things. Right? That there's, it's, it's, this, this beatitude, this line is so universal. It's, it's broad, right? Children of God are peacemakers. And so we get that sense there that all of us really have this calling. In addition, that word peacemaker in the Greek is the word irene poel, which means uh, uh, peacemaking, peacemaking. That's the same word that's used for Jesus in Colossians chapter 1, that he made peace between ourselves and God the Father. In the same way, what Jesus did, irene poel, is now our calling to be peacemakers in turn. And so we have to recognize this is not a narrow group of people like missionaries or pastors where it's only some people that do that. This is the children of God. If you consider yourself a child of God, then we all have this calling. Now, I think that can be very intimidating to think about because many of us have not considered that before. And we don't think of ourselves as peacemakers. So to think about it being a universal thing that every single person in this room has a calling to be a peacemaker feels very overwhelming and intimidating. But what I wanted to do is uh, explain what the word poeo means. Remember, peacemaking is uh, irene poeo, the second half being that word poeo. That word in Greek, um, in English, it actually means to make or do. But that's not the end of the definitions of poeo. So let me just catalog one, a few of the 26 definitions of that word. This is what the word means. It means to produce or construct form something, it means to be the author or the cause of something, to make something ready, to prepare for something, to produce it, to acquire it, to provide a thing for oneself, to render it, to ordain or to appoint it, to declare it, to make someone do something or to cause one to be the author of it, to act rightly, to do something well or to carry it out, to execute upon it, 
to pass it, like, a, like the Passover, to celebrate it, to keep it, to make ready, to institute. <laughs> That's what the word poeo means. And so when we think about peacemaking, it's legitimate to say peacemaking is all of these things. It's peace, peace authoring. It's peace celebrating. It is peace instituting. It is peace acting. It is peace executing. It is all of these things ultimately. And it's a very broad word that peacemaking and shalom building is not just one action, but many different ones that we all can do all throughout our lives. This is not that I need to have a certain jacket and do a certain thing. All of us can do this. Then maybe some of us speak peace to other people. Maybe some of us prepare peace in communities or in families. Maybe some of us celebrate it. I don't know what it is, but when we realize the, 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 the width and the, the breadth of that word, all of us are invited into it. All of us can do this because this is a word that is very broad and invites us all to participate. The other thing that that word poeo we should recognize, it's an active verb. It's not a passive one, right? It's not a word, verb of being. It's a, word, a verb of doing. And if you remember those definitions, how many of them are active? How many of them are doing things? And we have to realize peacemaking is not just kind of being soft and nice and saying, oh, guys, let's get along. That's kind of what we need to do. It's much more active than that. And I think that's the second reminder that we get out of this, this word, uh, peacemaking, at any poeo. We all can do this. And maybe you don't do it like me, and maybe you don't do it like someone else, but we're all invited to do this all throughout our lives. The, sec the, the final thing that I think um, I take away from the sense of Jesus being our peace, right, and not just being a calling, but a person, is that if Jesus is our peace, we must always put Jesus at the center of our efforts at peacemaking. Remember what we said is that in the Old Testament, they understand shalom. They get it, but they can't do it. We have hope not because we understand a word, but because we have a person because of what Jesus has done. That's our hope. Not that we comprehend shalom, not that we're so awesome at it, but that Jesus has fulfilled it. Our hope for shalom is completely embodied by a person. And so what that means is that if we want to fulfill our calling as peacemakers, we can't stray from Jesus. We have to center Jesus in this universal calling. Why I think that's really important is I think there is a growing sense in myself where Jesus becomes fairly decentered or pushed away when it comes to being a peacemaker, when it comes to pursuing justice. And there's an increasing sense in which we need to become educated. We need to know, you know, uh, the lay of the land. We need to be politically informed and active and, and all of these things. And these are, all, these are all great things. They're not sinful in any way, shape, or form. And I just want to acknowledge that. But at the same time, we have to recognize that our source of peace is not how politically active we are. It is not how woke we are. It is not how informed we are. For Christians, our peace is Christ. Christ sits at the center. And because of Christ, we get informed. Because of Christ, we get active. Because of Christ, we boldly go and say what we need to say. But we don't reverse that order. We don't put those other things at the center. We remember that Christ is our peace. And so we center him in this calling. He is our first step and our last step in this calling to being peacemakers. And nowhere is this better exemplified than in the life of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We all know of Dr. Kim as, Dr. King as, I wish he was Korean, Dr. Kim, uh, but he's not. Um, he is a, a peacemaker, a shalom builder, someone who wanted shalom, wholeness for as many people as possible. But that's very much what his ministry is. So he is a peacemaker. But Sometimes I think we forget the source of that peace, what, what he was rooted in in order to derive the strength to do this. But this is what he would say at Cornerstone Church in Brooklyn in one of his sermons. He says, I'm not going to fool you this afternoon. Sometimes I feel discouraged. Living every day under the threat of death, sometimes I feel discouraged. Having to stand amid the surging moment of life's restlessness, sometimes I feel discouraged. Having to face the problems and the frustrations, sometimes I feel discouraged. Sometimes I feel discouraged and feel my work is in vain. But he goes on to say this. But the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. 
I heard the voice of Jesus promise to never leave me alone, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach the gospel to the poor, and to preach the acceptable year of the Almighty God. And here we see it. Here we see that the calling of peacemaking, which is upon all of us, Dr. King's calling is all of our calling. What he did is what we do, maybe in some smaller measure, but we are all peacemakers if we're children of God. But like with Dr. King, our source and the one who calls us and the one who sustains us is Jesus, the one who became our peace. And so I hope you're following me in all of this, that our peace is Jesus in every single way. He's the one who establishes this shalom between us and God and one another. And he becomes our peace. And if he becomes our peace, then we all become peacemakers. But in order to be peacemakers, we need more of Jesus. We can't descend to him. We can't push him away. As tempting as that is in this world to do, we have to recognize that our source will always be Christ. With that, I want to celebrate um, the Lord's Supper very much in that light. Our sister Jess McDonald has uh, baked this bread this morning for us, and we want to recognize her contribution. But today, as we take this sacrament together, I want us to be reminded of what we just talked about that when we're breaking this bread and um, drinking of this cup, we're remembering that this is peace, that this is shalom, that Jesus became shalom, that he is this peace that we desire in our hearts and our world spiritually and eternally. This is peace. But also we are recognizing that if Jesus is peace, then we are peacemakers. And we get sustained for that incredibly difficult calling by Jesus. And so may this be a moment for us to remember that Jesus is our peace, but also that he sustains us in our calling to peace. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after breaking it said, This is my body, which is broken for each of you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup, this is a new covenant, which is in my blood. Do this however often you drink of it, in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat of this bread or we drink of this cup, we are celebrating the Lord's death until he returns again. I'm going to ask us to bow our heads in a moment of prayer and reflection. And to again, let's meditate and think about Jesus being our peace. Shalom is not a calling. It is a person that we celebrate this morning. And at the same time, we are fueled and sustained for this calling by Jesus. Let's prepare our hearts together in prayer. And I'm also invite the worship team and those who are serving the sacrament to come up at this time.